Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the third day of the learning week by IoT Creators. And for today, uh, as I mentioned, we will have the success and failure cases with LTM and NBIoT with Oli. Oli is the co-CEO of Sorak. And as we also get to know Sorak yesterday a bit, uh, they are designing they are designing world-friendly IoT solutions. And Oli is also has a lot of hands-on experience with designing world-friendly IoT solutions. So I am sure it will be a very interesting session today uh, that he will share his experiences, Sodak's experiences with LTM and narrowband IoT. Um, thank, thank you so much again, Oli, for joining us. Thank you so much, Janset. So thank you, Oli. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here so that I have some uh, additional uh, background uh, to show. Um, so uh, it should be that my uh, full screen slide is now in uh, in screen. Yes, correct. Okay, awesome. So uh, thank you for having me. I'm I'm really excited to be here. Um, I've been uh, connected somehow uh, to. Uh, to IoT creators since uh, since the, the the beginning of it, uh, invited by uh, Janset and Afsal to uh, to come and give a presentation on uh, success and failure cases, uh, to tell a bit about Sodak, what we do, um, and uh, hopefully to engage with some of you to spark some inspiration or some thoughts or discussion. Um, I'm really open to uh, to 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 meeting uh, anyone uh, who who is here today and and discussing opportunities together or um, maybe your failure and success cases um, everyone has uh, has failed in order to be successful so I always view failure as something really important and, and something really good um, but uh, you'll uh, you'll see more about that as I go through the slides so uh, a bit about me um, I've been uh, with uh, or I've been in in, in IOT actually uh, my whole career I've been uh, I've been working uh, on on Sodak for um, almost uh, almost ten years now, and uh, currently uh, co CEO, um, and uh, mainly focusing on, uh, on 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 new business and and on creating new opportunities and uh, and, and and meeting new people. So um, a bit about Sodak. So um, our objective is really to use IoT for good and to 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 get the most out of. Uh, what we can do with data that we capture. Um, and uh, with that, we've coined the term world-friendly IoT. So we believe that, you know, there's many ways of going about uh, tracking and sensing, uh, but there are also good ways of doing it, which are less wasteful. And uh, actually, IoT can be used to also minimize waste. Think of supply chains that, uh, that are reducing the amount of resources needed uh, to get something from point A to point B because of having more data available. And uh, uh, with that, that, we really pride ourselves as, as having a, a high standard of quality in getting data safely and reliably to the cloud. So you've all seen these kind of graphs. Um, we're expecting to uh, exponentially grow in terms of number of installed IoT devices in the world. Yeah, really fantastic. Uh, and every every year we 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 go by, uh, the the number of billions increases. But the question a lot of people ask is: Is this really happening? Um, where where are the devices in my neighborhood? Um, are we are we actually doing anything, or are we just talking about it? So there's a lot of companies that are saying a lot of different things. And uh, as Sodak, we involve ourselves in part of what we would call the value chain. Uh, we understand a lot of about hardware components. We've worked with a lot of suppliers. Uh, we do design services. Uh, we work with manufacturers, connectivity providers, and um, the ones who store and display and analyze the data for the customer. So um, in the value chain, we, we play a few of the roles, I guess, all the way up to front end dashboards. And then for data analysis, um, there are so many different industries where uh, IoT solutions are used, as you'll see in a moment, that every vertical has its experts. So whether that be uh, logistics at airports or uh, specifically agricultural supply chains, um, there are different data analysis companies that are optimal for us to work with. So what you can see here is uh, that we mainly specialize in software, hardware and industrial design uh, primarily. Um, and this has been the case for the last uh, nine uh, plus years. We've developed all sorts of solutions 
and uh, yeah, very hardware focused. So hardware is a is a tough game, and uh, lately we've actually included in our service offering um, service and support. So devices in the field being used and uh, being able to produce devices on a mass scale and also visualize and, and uh, store the data in the, in the back end. And these are new skills that we've added to our, uh, to our portfolio. Um, we also have a product portfolio and a lot of these will come back. Um, I think our, our, Pride and Joy, our flagship product, uh, you can see here. So Sodak actually originates from um, sh being short for solar power data acquisition. So we have a solar panel here on our on our device, uh, very nicely camouflaged, uh, that, that powers the device, meaning that we can send uh, many, many more messages from the same set of hardware than we could if it was just battery powered. You'll see some of the examples why that's so important. But these are the products that that... Uh, we're we're uh, we're actually offering at the moment mainly in uh, GPS or GNSS uh, localization, be it uh, high accuracy or uh, regular accuracy, uh, as well as communication and some sensing aspects. So I want to start with success cases. So I I, uh, I want to share a bit of a disclaimer here. So. Um, Failure cases don't per se mean failed projects and success cases don't per se mean successful implementations. So those, th those for me are, are, are some differences. Um, also, why am I showing success cases first? Um, because I wanna keep you curious about the failure cases because I, I know all of you wanna know how we've messed up uh, here and there. So to keep your attention going, I'm, I'm starting with the success cases. So uh, what you see here is, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a big number, 450,000 uh, devices. Um, we actually have a, a huge seed pack like this in our office. Um, it's a, a container that carries seeds from a warehouse to, uh, to a farm, um, and uh, mainly in, uh, in large agricultural regions like uh, um, around Philadelphia in the U.S. So... We were requested to create a, a device that can track these these containers. Um, we initially were developing with buyer the customer a smart label that could be simply stuck to anything, paper thin, and you can track your goods. Problem being, the antenna required for some regions needs to be very powerful uh, because, especially in the U.S., you 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 have uh, in some regions less uh, network coverage, and so the more uh, powerful your antenna uh, is, or uh, the larger your, your, your antenna is and, and the bigger ground plane you have and the more power you can provide to it, uh, meaning also the more power you need uh, will affect whether your device will work in uh, areas that are a bit further out of the range of, of, the, of the telecom network. So first uh, actually sort of failure was that we couldn't use these smart labels in this use case, also because they didn't last 10 years. So what did we do? We went back to the drawing board and um, we started to look at how does the client process work? So they fill the seed packs, they go to the distribution center, then they go to the client, then to the farm and they're cleaned and then they're back to buy. So how can we actually gain control over this process? Because a lot of these seed packs either went missing or stayed at the farm for too long. So we went to this area of the US ourselves, did a bunch of installations and started actually getting our hands dirty. So uh, you may have seen uh, my father, Jan Willem, who I work in the, in the business with um, on, the, on the webinar yesterday. Here he is uh, after a long day of mounting devices. So we created, uh, an, in this case, non-solar powered tracker that uh, is integrated with the ERP system of the customer and helps to reduce loss of these, these seed containers, which was a key part, figuring out that that, that was the client's issue. Um, and by having better control over where these containers were, out of the, let's say, uh, um, out of the 450,000 seed packs in operation, they could actually reduce to 400,000, um, meaning less transportation and less production cost whenever uh, uh, they had any, any issues in the supply chain. So we started tracking these seed packs from, uh, from warehouse to farm, getting really good data out of it. And uh, so, so that was the first success case. Um, 
Now I'm, I'm going to go through uh, the next ones a little bit quicker. So that was a quite an elaborate one. Um, and here you can see, you know, we we do all sorts of uh, designs, modifications. You can see here a uh, milling machine that actually cut one of the corners of the, the flanges that are used to stick the, the tracker to the seed pack off in an automated way because the product didn't fit on the top right image. Uh, we created magnet holders that allowed us to monitor whether using a, a magnet to monitor whether the, uh, the bottom of the seed pack was opened and the seeds were released to help buyer to better identify usage. Um, and uh, uh, we've, we've really lately also started increasing the volumes of devices that we're, we're sending out. Next one. This is really a, an IoT creators project at the core. Um, we um, worked with ProRail to uh, to monitor assets, so buildings on on the, the alongside the, the the train tracks in the Netherlands. ProRail is uh, one of the rail man, uh, management companies in the Netherlands. So, what went well here? We connected all sorts of sensors to a central uh, NBIoT and LTEM box uh, using a, a dev kit, which. Uh, uh, we've really sold many of in the past. And uh, what went well uh, in this asset monitoring use case is that it worked. Uh, I think success when it works is, is there. However, not everything went perfect because the client actually stopped after the project. Uh, the um, client was actually uh, uh, more of an innovation manager at ProRail rather than an operations person. So he did his job successfully um, but then the, the project stopped, so we didn't scale up because uh, the operations people never actually needed this product. So, so we made like a Swiss army knife that you could connect any sensor to. It was way too expensive. Um, now, what we learned here is that either you design to scale or you design not to scale. So it is possible to do a project uh, like we did here uh, with uh, around 100 devices. So we got, we got connectivity from IoT creators. And... Um, we had a successful implementation. However, if you want to scale, then you need to completely change your ideas about design because your bill of materials, for example, cannot be as high as when you're trying not to scale. Um, more on that uh, soon. Next one is quite a bit more technical. Um, we did a, a large uh, implementation and test of EDRX on LTEM in the US. Now, what is EDRX? EDRX is a, a, a part of the uh, a part of the LTM and NBIoT standards uh, that allows you to actually have a lower power device. So um, what the device does is it agrees with the with the network that it is going to listen for a message coming in at a certain frequency. That means that it's not going to send anything on that moment, but it's just going to listen. The network knows if it has a message, for example. I want to know where my tracker is to send to that tracker, then in that moment, it knows the tracker will be awake because it agreed with the tracker that at that moment it would be awake. Now that's, that's, uh, that's EDRX. So you can maximize the amount of sleep time, minimize the amount of communication time and still have a high rate of availability. So we had a tracker with a really small battery. Um, what we did is we did uh, analyses in the top right. You can see uh, of power consumption profiles. Uh, we made an extremely complicated software flow. Um, we measured how, how many joules per day the device used, depending on how many tracking area updates needed to be done. So we, we really did field implementations of devices moving around to different cell towers and what impact that had on whether EDRX actually worked. We were very early days in, uh, in EDRX implementations. I think a lot of the telcos uh, benefited a lot from all the uh, engineering efforts we put into this. Um, and uh, what we're most proud of here is the minimum power consumption that, uh, that we achieved, uh, which actually allowed us to have a device working for almost a year on a, a very, very tiny battery. So, and continuously being available for, uh, for emergency tracking purposes. Also, we learned that Wi-Fi positioning is it's way more power efficient than, for example, GPS positioning. And out of an analysis of different modules in the market, um, we, uh, we learned that Nordic Semiconductors has really the best power performance, the best availability of support, uh, as uh, I think uh, a lot of you can, can attest to. Next, um, 
So back to the, the solar story. Um, actually, uh, I think around uh, four to five years ago, we were approached by uh, a company called Movement. They wanted to track cattle um, in, a, in a very low cost way. They said, we need a device that, that lasts over three years uh, in the ear of a cow. And uh, it needs to send an update uh, of GPS position uh, to the internet every 15 minutes. So we said, well, if, if you have to use uh, a battery powered solution for that, you need a battery pack that's about the size of the head of the cow. That's definitely not going to work. Um, so uh, we, uh, we suggested let's, let's try it out with solar. And uh, no one believed at that point that in terms of power consumption, you could, you could actually make that happen with a really small ear tag. The requirement was was that it, that it weighed around the uh, 35 grams. And so uh, we actually uh, managed to, to, to create the first ever solar powered device of this size. Um, and uh, this actually triggered us to, to be able to, to make the, the, the move because the, the ear tag was on, uh, on LoRa, LoRa One, but we actually were triggered to make the move to a, a similar sized uh, cellular device uh, on LTEM a narrowband, in fact, in this case, just narrowband IoT, um, for monitoring electricity poles uh, and, and other types of assets, uh, whether they've started to fall over or not. Uh, you'll be surprised what kind of insurance claims uh, are, are made in countries like the US uh, um, about electricity poles falling on top of people or houses. Uh, and um, so we started designing a solar powered what we called an inclinometer that measures the inclination of a certain asset. And uh, what we really learned here is that we can do things sustainably. Um, we, can, we can use solar panels in combination with supercapacitors. Um, we, we actually have really been pushing, moving away from rechargeable batteries and towards uh, rechargeable capacitors uh, that basically have an infinite lifespan. You can recharge them more than a million times, as opposed to a few thousand times with lithium batteries. And uh, they have way less uh, environmental impact also when disposed. So next uh, project is uh, again, back to Bayer. Uh, we were asked by Bayer, can we use a camera in a low power way to identify whether there are pests in a certain region? So they had a pest trap that normally people would have to go to manually and, and count what type of pests there were in there and report that information. And then they could, could measure actually whether there were certain uh, pest outbreaks in regions uh, and therefore supply certain chemicals and products to, to farmers. Um, now we actually managed to make it work again that went well. Um, what we made was kind of a, a smart trap uh, for, for, for really small pests uh, like, like flies and, and could count them using a low power imaging. Um, however, what we did learn here is that there wasn't an immediate business case to scale up. Um, so it never progressed, um, but we're really excited still about the technology and what it can do. And we learned that you can do way more on the device. So we were sending large data packets over LTEM using a lot of energy, um, but uh, you can actually do a lot of uh, machine learning on, on this type of the device. So we started investigating, investigating that after uh, this project. Um, next um, is uh, basically a, a video that I wanna show you. Um, so basically, we were requested by a trailer tracking company, Krone, uh, or trailer manufacturer, Krone, whether we can make a tracker for them. And uh, uh, in this project, I would say everything went wrong, but also everything went right. And uh, we, we, we made a, a tracker that, that works everywhere in the world. Uh, we've, we've sent it on, on ships uh, from Southeast Asia through Africa to Europe. Um, and we really learned in this project that it's best to work with clients that want the best for your business. So Krona actually invested in the development of this product uh, and basically handed us the rights to be able to, to sell uh, this product to other companies as well, because they understood that if we are able to sell this product too, we can generate more income and keep investing in the product and, and, and growing as a company. And as a supplier, that's really valuable to them. Also, we learned about the value of 2G fallback. So having fallback options for communication, uh, challenges with roaming. We had to really 
do a lot of testing before our software was so robust that we could handle all of the different networks that the device traveled to, having um, sort of timers in place that it wouldn't drain the battery too much if it wasn't getting a connection, and uh, also doing smart scanning if there was any, any connection at all. Um, we also learned a lot about manufacturers and components. Uh, in the component crisis, this product really needed to scale up and we were quite disappointed by certain manufacturers and component suppliers. But, you know, within all of that, we still really see it as a, a raving success. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna just open the, the, the video. Im tagtäglichen Austausch mit unseren Krone Trailer Kunden fragen diese uns immer wieder nach der Zuverlässigkeit und Produktsicherheit unserer Krone Telematik. Vor allem die Hardwarequalität ist ein beliebtes Thema, denn hier geht es um die langfristige Einsatzsicherheit für unsere Kunden. Und aus diesem Grund zeige ich euch heute, welche Extremsituation unsere KSC Solar so alles aushält. Es kann immer mal passieren, dass die Einheit auf den Boden fällt. Aber das war ja noch keine Extremsituation, da geht noch mehr. Weil mechanische Stabilität oberste Priorität hat, hält die KSC Solar einiges aus, auch wenn sie mal unter die Räder kommt. Ganzjährige Einsatz unter rauen Bedingungen bei Schnee, Regen und Sonne erfordern ganz spezielle Testbedingungen. Wollen wir doch mal sehen, wie sich unsere KSC Solar im Korrosionstest erschlägt. Wir kommen später wieder und schauen uns das Ergebnis an. Nicht nur Nässe und Kälte sind ein wichtiges Kriterium bei der KSC Solar, sondern auch extreme Hitze. Der größte Feind der Elektronik ist Feuchte und Nässe. Deswegen stehen wir jetzt hier vor unserem, naja, nennen wir ihn mal Regensimulator. Sieht ja noch gut aus. Mal schauen, ob es noch funktioniert. Wir haben die Chronik HSC Solar Extremsituationen ausgesetzt. Wir haben sie aus großer Höhe nach unten fallen lassen. Wir sind mit dem LKW darüber gefahren. Wir haben sie extreme Hitze, aber auch Nässe ausgesetzt. Und zusätzlich waren wir noch in der Salzkammer. Das alles hat seine Spuren hinterlassen. Aber wie wir das jetzt auf der App hier sehen können, die Funktionalität lieber halten. So, of course, really exciting uh, to have such a video made by our partner or our client. Uh, and uh, they really, uh, you know, were, were quite, uh, quite, quite strict in the development process um, and uh, made sure that, uh, that this product was, was, you know, this robust. And uh, I think overall, a great learning experience for us as a company. Uh, they really helped us to grow to the next level in terms of professional organization. Next, I'd like to go to one of the final uh, success cases, which is a high precision GPS um, tr tracking device. Actually, this device is used on different building sites currently across the Netherlands, but soon expanding to um, yeah, other countries around the world, especially interesting in Delta regions where the soil is quite soft. Um, when, for example, a, a bridge is built, a lot of sand or other material needs to be deposited to create a strong foundation and we can actually measure in 3d how that material deposits over time so we can plan way ahead of time uh, when a construction can start so we create really clear graphs uh, and predictions uh, ahead of time this is again solar powered device uh, no lithium battery in here so it's uh, fully co2 neutral during usage and uh, communicates via LTM. We learned how to uh, really uh, use a, a, a yeah, higher power device in a very efficient way. Also a higher data volume. So we're really sending a lot of uh, GNSS information that's raw and processing it in the cloud to get it to millimeter accuracy in 3D uh, position. So uh, 
really a step up from, from the normal GPS tracking. Um, I would say we made the impossible possible in this project because a few companies had failed um, before our client approached us and this product successfully implemented now. Um, then uh, the exciting part, uh, the failure cases. So um, a lot of things also uh, have gone wrong, uh, as you'll see. Um, I'd like to start with Rotary Die project. We uh, were requested by a company to, uh, to help doing predictive maintenance of uh, rotating cutting machines. So you have to imagine an industrial process, a uh, rotating cutting machine turns a certain number of times before parts need to be replaced. So we, uh, we put an accelerometer in a, in a test setup uh, and uh, we're trying to simulate that basically and count uh, whether we could, could automate the monitoring in a, in a way that, that works with an accelerometer. However, that sensor didn't actually get to serve the purpose. So there, there was no way in, in, in our Envision project uh, that we could actually monitor this. And I'm sure some of you listening have clear solutions for this. We'd love to hear them. Um, it's quite a, a long time ago that we did this project. So we, we, we decided to move away from it. Um, we had to learn how to fail fast. Uh, and, and we actually did that well here because we decided not to continue the creation of a product uh, when we knew just the sensor didn't work. Uh, we learned what accelerometers are not good for. for. Next, Rotterdam Harbor project. Uh, I think some of the colleagues at, uh, at uh, IoT Creators might even remember this. Um, we, uh, we, we had done an implementation of NB-IoT to track non-powered uh, boats or barges. Um, and uh, what went wrong was we actually didn't have any roaming or any fallback um, mechanisms in place. So as soon as these devices went over the border to Belgium or to Germany, we lost them. And then they were trying to connect continuously and they lost all their power. And there was basically when they returned, they were not connected anymore. So we had no idea how to find them. And the client said, wow, this is a terrible product. Um, I don't want to work with you guys anymore. Uh, and we actually lost them to, to a competitor. Uh, I think one of the things that went wrong is we were very early in the market with the solution. Um, and uh, we had made a, a very rugged GPS sensor, but we, we learned if you use solar on this product, it can come back to life. So if the battery dies, then at least over time, it will recharge and then connect again. Um, we also didn't build in any protection mechanisms in terms of retrying connections. Um, and no fallback, for example, to 2G, which at the time was available across the border. Next, um, some of you may have seen, we did a successful uh, crowdfunding project for an air quality monitoring device. Um, now, we were so excited about this and so focused on the technology um, and didn't really fully realize that what we were doing was creating a business to consumer oriented product um, and what really went wrong here is we sent a bunch of devices to clients really happy after a very difficult production process. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, we had not properly prepared support processes or user manuals. So our support department was completely overwhelmed with all of the questions. How does it work? This is everything's going wrong. It seemed like it was a terrible product to everyone. And after a lot of time investment from the whole company, uh, things started to, to kind of smoothen out a little bit again. I think there are some people who are not so happy with us. Um, we had made a really low cost mass production version of previously what was the sniffer bike, which was a huge clunky device, uh, also working on uh, NB-IoT and LTM, depending on which country the device was in. And um, yeah, when you produce, let's say a thousand of these units without any support process, you're uh, really doomed. Uh, so that was a big learning for us. Obviously, care about your customer. Uh, think, what is my customer going to do once he gets these things uh, or these devices? Uh, how is my customer going to experience it? Um, but so uh, yeah, with that learning, we could really continue to scale up. Next, um, we uh, were asked by a, a large uh, cable a manufacturing company to uh, actually their innovation hub to create a uh, device that could monitor where these cable drums were, uh, which were worth tens of thousands of euros, and how much cable was being used. Um, and uh, 
What went wrong here was that there was actually no end client lined up. So there was no business around this creation. So we made a really low power track very nimble that could scale. So we learned from the past mistake uh, and um, we tried to do tests and we thought the client was doing tests as well. And they were really kind of misleading us in terms of reasons why things were not getting off the ground. We thought it was a technical problem and we really learned you need to ask questions like, is there an end client? Is there a budget? How is it gonna scale? Where is it gonna scale? Can I talk to the end client? I think especially the last one, if you can talk to the end client, then only then you know for sure that you're, uh, you're doing things that are worthwhile. Um, we also didn't agree the testing parameters with the client. So they were testing for different purposes than we were. So we thought we were getting good results and they, they thought they weren't. Um, and uh, yeah, of course, really learned to ask more questions uh, about the end client. Next one. Uh, you can see a really cool, slick solar power device in the bottom right here. Um, this device never actually existed. So it's a nice render that our uh, industrial design team made. Um, we had a use case of uh, tracking uh, basically perpetually um, for families, uh, their, their elderly family members. Uh, this is actually quite a large market. Um, and we thought, well, if we make a, a kind of energy harvesting, let's say solar powered watch, um, then they'll never have to worry about charging because we thought in the top image, a classical device, the charging was something that brought risk that sometimes if it wasn't charged, the elderly person wasn't safe. Well, we were totally wrong. Nobody wanted this. Um, and uh, luckily we had only made renders uh, to, to, to learn this. Um, and uh, also that this is a completely, again, business to consumer market. We learned a lot about elderly people, um, which is totally not related to any of our other business practices. And uh, we also learned not to diversify too much as a company. So it is tracking, but it's a totally different market and different use case. Next, um, the first brick of the series. Um, we uh, created a device um, together with our, uh, our client mobility sensing uh, for monitoring road quality, measuring number of vehicles and detecting ice on roads. Um, what was wrong was that the devices were kind of permanently mounted in the road. And it was in the early days of NBIOT rollout. And uh, the network was changed in a way uh, while the devices were installed that was incompatible with the previous communication. Now, there was some messages that had gone out about this. We didn't fully follow uh, the communications there. And so we made a great device that became a brick. I have to imagine a few hundred euros per device in the road, completely wasted. Um, what we did learn is OTAU, so over the air updates. Um, also, talk to the operator and be patient with the network rollout. So if it's just been rolled out, doesn't mean you have to immediately do the installation. And also with over the air updates, always have a plan on how to update the software remotely. So we've actually implemented since that, uh, that event on all of our devices that they can do this. The next brick was, you saw the cool video uh, of our client Krona. Actually, the first version of that device was a uh, completely potted, made out of potting material, which is kind of a hard resin, uh, a tracker. It was uh, basically bulletproof. Uh, no water could ever go in here because there was no air to be filled by the water. Uh, and um, we created a not fully production ready device. And because it was potted, we couldn't change anything on the hardware because it was completely blocked off from ever being accessed again. So we created samples that turned into bricks that were really like bricks. And we still have them here at the office. Sometimes we use them actually uh, to make sure that uh, uh, some books or magazines stay in the right place because that's the only value that these devices now have uh, rather than actually working as, as trackers. So really learning was it's not sustainable to do this, no reuse of components and don't do potting of full devices. It's not necessary. Even if you want IP69 uh, rating uh, on, your, on your product, um, look into other alternatives such as ultrasonic welding, uh, but don't fully pot your device. It's not necessary. It's not sustainable. I'll repeat it again. Next, 
uh, we created a Bluetooth gateway. So uh, here you can just look at the top, the device on the top there with uh, all the complicated cables. Um, we had a use case for tracking the tools in a warehouse. Uh, we had a, a, yeah, a client who was ready to scale up with that. And they said, okay, you know, we want to use tags, we want to use gateways. Um, please provide us with a solution. So we found really good tags that uh, uh, we, we, we implemented a, a software that would work with the gateways. And uh, the problem was that the gateway hardware we used didn't have enough receive power on the antennas. So over a certain range, they actually didn't and see the tags. So we had all these tags for in the warehouse, but we had gateways that couldn't forward the information of the tags to the cloud. So the whole solution was useless. Um, and we tried to use off-the-shelf components. Now, our big learning here was uh, something that you'll hear our RF expert uh, from our hardware team uh, case say, test antennas first and build the product around the antennas. The antennas are the core of the product in any type of cellular communication. So we have a test setup. The first thing we do uh, is we create a ground plane of a certain form factor. We check theoretically, will it work? Then we do a test before we finish the whole hardware design. Will it actually have enough output and receive power? And then we start to build all the other components around it on the PCB and then the rest of the mechanical design around the product. So really in that order is, is really important. Also, um, we recently launched then a, a Bluetooth gateway version of our track solar, much less complicated, really good antenna setup and works extremely well. So uh, again, sometimes problems resolve themselves uh, over time uh, as well. So that's it in terms of cases. Um, as, a, as a last part, I want to draw some conclusions from the different cases that, that you've, uh, you've, you've seen here. Um, so I want to start with failure reasons. So uh, as I mentioned, everything can go wrong. That's, that's kind of a starting point. Um, but you can also split it up. So in some cases, uh, there's something wrong with the device. Uh, think of brick devices, so no uh, updatable software remotely, no connectivity over the border, uh, being too early, um, potting devices, cementing devices into the road. These are all things that you know you should you should definitely try to uh, to avoid. Also, building a solution with poor antenna, definitely a no go when we're talking about LTEM and narrowband IoT. Then, in terms of clients, um, which is another reason things can fail, is there's no business case or no demand. Really, ask your clients. So someone can say, "I want you to design the solution. I have so many customers for this, or I have such a high demand. But let's see the proof first. In some cases, maybe even get them to sign something that they'll actually buy it from you. Uh, and then uh, lastly here, uh, not properly supporting your client is also uh, a, a really a, a reason for uh, failing. Then success reasons, a bit of a simpler uh, diagram here. Everything can go right. Well, um, theoretically, uh, never the case. Um, first reason why it can go right is that it works. Uh, you're already really far if it works. Congratulations. Um, a, lot of, a lot of experiments fail. A lot of devices don't work. So you're, you're a long way. And making the impossible possible. I, uh, I think this is one of the things we love to do most. Uh, that's, that's in the, the, the DNA of any innovator. I think the whole IoT creators community is, is, is really centered around uh, you know, creating new things, both in business cases and in terms of, uh, of, of devices. And uh, for us, really low power consumption is, is essential for any type of uh, non-powered uh, monitoring of, of um, moving assets or certain environmental conditions and uh, first ever solar powered devices uh, of a really small size for us was, was one of the reasons really for success. So, so find your, your niche, find your expertise and really uh, own in on that, uh, on that expertise. And then lessons learned, uh, also really important to, to summarize. Um, first of all, focus. So um, like I said, you know, pick your direction. Uh, don't start going uh, and developing uh, uh, trackers for elderly people if you're actually in the business to business segment. Uh, that's a no-go. And do your research. So test 
on the device. So uh, build flexibility into the product. Um, also, you know, a lot can go wrong in terms of component sourcing and manufacturers in the process. So make sure you have backup plans um, and build in fallbacks. And then secondly, for testing, um, build around the antenna, as I said, and use sustainable components because these devices will last much longer. Um, think of solar and super caps, come to us. We can give you a lot of, of support and advice. Um, and uh, in terms of understanding the client, uh, which is uh, the second part of the research, is care about them, ask them questions, um, agree on specifications and test criteria beforehand. Also, never such a bad idea, especially if you're doing a large project with many stages um, and, and milestones. Uh, if you're only paid at the end of the project, agree what are the conditions under which we will be paid. That also doesn't always go smoothly. Um, and lastly, define the business case. Is it scalable? Do you mind? I mean, that depends on every company as well. For us, we're moving more and more towards scalable solutions because we feel that our time is best invested in things that are on a large scale because we're trying to do things more world friendly than, than, than most others. So, um, you know, our growth would be good for the world. And uh, with that, uh, I want to I wanna actually introduce uh, as, a, as a last part, a really exciting new world-friendly solution. Um, it's uh, the Sodec label. So the world's thinnest chip and tracker, which many of you have heard about, is now also rechargeable. Uh, we just uh, are launching this, this solution now. It's a solution that's uh, wirelessly charging, uh, that uh, has a supercapacitor that's paper thin and uh, can be really stealthily hidden on, on any type of parcel or, uh, or asset and uh, works perfectly with our or your customer backend. Um, and uh, part of our uh, sort of product portfolio now with uh, the solar power trackers. And uh, it's, it's really the, the, yeah, more for the, the short trips, uh, uh, closed loop uh, logistics tracking type solutions um, can be set uh, for, for certain uh, communication intervals uh, can be triggered by um, uh, a magnet, can be triggered by motion, uh, similar to our other devices, and monitors temperature. So all that in a really small form factor. So uh, with that, uh, I want to thank you. Uh, I'm personally going to be off to making many more use cases happen. That for me is the most exciting part of, of what we do. Um, and uh, also hoping to engage with some of you on use cases. And uh, I think uh, we're, uh, we're pretty good on time here. So also thank you uh, from, uh, from the entire Sodak team. Uh, and uh, you know, also on that front, uh, we're always growing and always expanding and happy to talk if, uh, if you see uh, yourself fitting as a partner or, or, or team member here. So uh, thank you, uh, Janset, and uh, ready for some questions. Thank you so much, Olio, for all these uh, great stories. Some of them I just know of the topic, but I didn't know the whole story. He didn't give me also any spoilers. So it was very interesting, especially the last tin uh, label that you showed was, is it uh, like maybe before, sorry, everyone, but before jumping to the uh, cr other questions, is it like also solar powered or is it rechargeable via something so else? It's, um... Like uh, how uh, the, the most recent smartphones are wirelessly chargeable. That's, that's how it's recharged uh, for the moment. Wow. It, yeah, so, so uh, it's really, uh, it charges in, in about two minutes because of the super capacitor. Uh, and then it can go with the next, next shipment. That's, that's all amazing, thank you. Okay, so now I'm checking the questions and there are some questions that are like more gener generic about, uh, that includes all the use cases and some of them more deep diving into the use case. And I, I think I want to start with the deep dive ones, actually. Uh, so you mentioned this project that was requested by the innovation manager. Uh, and there is a question, question for that one. So uh, the audience asked, did you ever see a project scale when the demand came from an innovation manager instead of someone who was really a part of company's operations? So like, does it really have to come from an operational uh, perspective or can it be still successful if it comes from an innovation manager? Let's put it like Very that. good question. So yeah. uh, actually the first use case I shared started with the innovation uh, department. Um, 
It depends per client, whether it's the IT department or a separate innovation part, but often you need those champions because they understand what the value is of the technology. Um, and you need that, that du dual sort of approach. Um, and we're learning more and more over time that we need to contact the people in the different departments actually to get it to scale. Um, if you really want scale, like uh, if we want to equip all 450,000 of those seed packages with, uh, with trackers, then we need to talk to, let's say, the most senior people in, 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 in the company, also in operations. Um, but we couldn't have gotten there without the innovation department uh, promoting us actually to that department. Yeah, maybe it's a starting point, but then you also make sure that you talk to the operations and the higher level management as well. Yeah. Um, okay, another project related, not a question, but a comment from Afsal. He says that he remembers the project, Rotterdam project, but he never liked Rotterdam anyway. So maybe this is one of the reasons <laughs> why this project was so successful. I don't know, but actually another question on that one. So... Uh, which year was it and do you think that you would have had the same troubles in terms of roaming if you have done this project now or what would you have done differently so i'm, I'm not going to be exactly correct but uh, this was something like four years ago mm -hmm. um, and uh, it could have been five time flies um, but uh, if we would have done it now we would have first of all used one of our standard solutions and uh, we would have not had the same issues in terms of roaming in the neighboring countries of the Netherlands. However, if you see uh, some of our solutions now are going to uh, places across the world, let's say certain parts of South America or Eastern Asia uh, or in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, where uh, there is no coverage yet or no roaming available yet with certain networks, then we still have the same problem. So it's important to do good investigation before choosing the, the, the yeah, countries you promise you will be able to support yeah yeah maybe five years ago it was the same case in europe but now europe is more covered uh, deployments are better but it is not everywhere in the world unfortunately not yet um okay so another more use case specific question is that you mentioned the nordic 9160 was the best performance on power consumption but do you think the sip versus module for power consumption um, well, actually, that that uh, um, module is an SIP. So I think so too. Yeah, right. The, the, maybe it's a trick question to see from the audience if I actually know a bit more details on the technology. Could be because <laughs> because I think we have audience from Nordic as well, so maybe <laughs> that could be the nice. case. Yeah, but okay, it's self, the module itself is an SIP, right? Yeah, so it, it it's actually the it's it's a, from a single production die actually this this module. So uh, there's no sub components uh, to my knowledge inside there, um, and and uh, so it's the same uh, same power consumption. There's only one way of working with that uh, with that module. Okay, thank you, Ali. Uh, and I guess. Yeah, okay, another, I would say they are parallel and new questions. How accurate are the GPS positions when trackers are mo mounted on trailers? So yeah, let's go back to the tracker topic. So uh, it has everything to do with how long you scan for, for the position, um, which changes while you're, for example, moving. Um, I can say that in most cases, we promise around 10 meters. So it's not um optimal for all use cases so what we say is in the standard offering we do 10 meters so anyone who buys our product off the shelf gets that but if the client need is a few meters for example uh you want to monitor in a port whether a container arrives on a certain dock and you need to know within a few meters if it's correct then we can actually extend the uh, amount of time that we scan uh, we can adjust scanning times depending on whether we see motion or not and therefore without losing too much power we can we can increase the accuracy to just a few meters let's say uh, two to three meters okay yeah thank you so much um there is another question about the sodak label uh, does the sodak label works on lte or nbit uh, does it have antenna that can penetrate signals through walls or is it, it needs to be open air? 
So, so um, it, it, it penetrates through walls. It's a, a solution that works with uh, MBIOT and LTEM. Um, and uh, it, uh, yeah, for that reason, actually, is able to work indoors. Um, and uh, it's, um, yeah, growing in terms of number of countries where, uh, where MBIOT and LTEM are available. Yeah. Yeah, also yesterday we discussed the deep indoor coverage with uh, MBIT and LTM, so I guess it all goes quite parallel to that one. Okay, so now there are like more general questions about, you. I believe they are about your overview on success and failure, and I really like those questions as well. So one of them says, so you said the mistakes are good, but they can of course be very costly. Do you have some general advice on how to minimize failures? Some tips on how to fail first? How do I know right, when to stop? Um, so failures can go on for longer when you don't have a clear alignment in your team. So let's say you are the one talking to the client as the salesperson and you have your engineering team or your, your CTO uh, who's continuously improving the, the product to what they think are the feature requirements. Um, if you already know from a business side that it's doomed to fail and you don't communicate that, you're gonna spend a lot of hours. Also, there's one uh, thing that for us also with, with building these, these trackers, which I can definitely share, um, is we, we didn't fail fast. So we actually spent an, ridiculous amount of resources on uh, getting this product to market uh, because we, we didn't fail fast. We, we, we didn't work according to the sprint methodologies. So I can really advise doing that um, because it was an internal product. Um, and I would say always work with external clients, uh, whether it be a client who pays for the development or who will use the product. Um, in order to set the requirements. Because if you leave it up to internal needs, you will just keep piling on the list because uh, it feels like if I get to choose, then I'm like in a candy shop in my own uh, uh, production uh, of, a, of a product. Um, so uh, be careful with that. Yeah, it could have been a vicious cycle. No, thank you for your answer. Uh, another question, I guess it goes parallel. Uh, if there was one thing that you would have changed from the beginning, had you been able to know, had, had you been able to know about a failure and the corresponding learning before, what would that have been? Sorry, I just was very. <laughs> so I think I understand the question correctly. Sure. Um, I think um, whether you know, there's a lot of um, failure cases in this presentation, and and you'll see it, and you'll think, okay, well, that's valuable. I'm I'm gonna avoid making those mistakes but most lessons are learned by ourselves. So or that's at least what I believe. So um, it could be that, you know, you see, or we've seen the same mistake before and we only really learn from it when we make it ourselves because especially when something costs a lot of, of, of resources or money uh, in, a, in a mistake, then it really hurts. And when something hurts, that's when you learn uh, best, I would say. So uh, don't be afraid to get hurt uh, and, and and to learn from that and be a f be be daring actually to make the mistakes it's the it's the best part um and uh then you can be twice as proud and excited when it does work yeah but sometimes you need to do the mistake yourself as you said to really learn that um okay so Oli, what is your go-to-market business model is it direct in, in, or indirect sales or maybe both Let's, let's go to that. So it's both. So we have a um, uh, value added reseller model, uh, which is our primary focus. Like I said, um, for our tracking products, we are not experts per se in any of the verticals where these solutions are, are used. And so whether it's agriculture or pharmaceutical or uh, logistics on airports or rail car monitoring, um, how to actually advise these companies to to use the data that's that's not our our expertise we don't have any let's say uh logistics experts in our in our uh, in our company and that's where we work with partners and and those are our indirect sales channels so um we call them channel partners and then in terms of direct uh we do work with those channel partners to then approach end clients in order to still facilitate uh the, the the sales better 
so we we know the capacities of our our data analysis partners and with those capacities in mind we approach our clients so that we can still offer the end-to-end -end solution together with our partners so in a way we are also the reseller of our of our resellers um and uh in terms of engineering projects um yeah it's mostly just getting our name out there and, and having inbound uh requests uh you never know what kind of engineering someone needs to be done uh so you just need to be ready at any time to 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 support yeah, I guess this is the this is the challenge when of being like a solution provider because you need to be able to provide any kind of solution. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, another question about your business business model. Uh, so when the IoT market becomes more mature, do you think that Sodak will do tracking as a core business, or do you think that you will get more customer demand on designing new solutions? Uh, definitely the the latter. So. Um, we do have kind of a roadmap with different areas. We call it like the the, the Sodak uh, solar system, uh, which <laughs> consists of different elements. Uh, say uh, um, devices have more processing power over time. We can do more machine learning. That's one area where we will do a lot of projects. Um, and uh, we will actually use those learnings to improve our products as well. Um, but actually we will, we will in terms of our business model as the market matures we're already seeing a shift the early adopters were using developer kits a lot so we we're offering developer kits we actually stopped to do this um we stopped our web shop and we're now moving more on to uh yeah larger enterprises needing solutions on a big scale and 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 that's that's where it's going um when at some point uh most iot devices will 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 be scaling uh rather than uh, or more will be scaling than, than newly created, I believe. Yeah, thank you. And I guess this question is kind of deep diving into the previous one. So there's, this is about also you are currently creating mostly, I believe, tracking solutions and there's apparently a lot of demand for them. But if you would have more hours, what would you make? So what would be the second priority, let's say? Um, so if we had more hours, um, I think we would make solutions that are much, much, much more sustainable. So, um, I mean, thank you for this question because this is like one of the things that I'm most passionate about and I can talk about it for hours. Yeah, I but... was expecting this answer actually. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So um, you have to imagine that, that certain materials are not sustainable. So um, the amount of effort that it costs in a factory to, to manufacture them uh, is, is almost not worth actually creating them. Um, you know, the material that's used for electronics uh, is, is FR4, and it takes a lot of layers of different components and, and a lot of energy to, to, to make this material. And so if we can actually transition away from that to more, uh, you know, in stage one materials that can be easily separated, uh, think of uh, organic materials that can have uh, copper traces printed on them. If we can invest a lot in in making that uh, more commonplace, then the companies producing will be more motivated to produce for that, and then therefore it will become cost effective. And then you get this economies of scale model, uh, similar to the supercapacitors that I was talking about. We're investing a lot in supercapacitors. When we do an order for supercapacitors or a request for a form factor, we are actually one of the leading companies to place these requests and so by placing these requests we're enabling the manufacturer to 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 bring this new technology to the market and then in the long long term uh, think of microcontrollers that are made out of plastics that can be fully recycled think of uh, soluble uh, casing materials that after 10 years of use maybe are biodegradable same as the electronics um, so that in the way that in, in many developed places at the moment um, materials that you dispose of are separated think of your trash disposal system if we throw electronics away it should be able to be separated by the same machine uh, and not end up on a landfill because the um, electronics waste is much worse than what you've seen for example with the plastic waste problem that that we have at the moment yeah, great answer for that question. Thank you. Do you have maybe two more minutes, Ali? We have two last questions, Definitely. or do we need to do a shortcut? Perfect. 
Okay, so deep diving into the products again. Uh, who the SIM is managed on the label products? So which SIMs you are using, I guess, this question. So um, we're actually um, managing the, the, the SIMs and the connectivity ourselves. And we work with multiple different mobile network operators and virtual network operators. So you might've seen in, in one of the slides that we work with uh, Monogoto, uh, we work with um, uh, Pod Group, which is another mobile virtual network operator. We work with Onomondo. Uh, we work with Deutsche Telekom. Uh, uh, we work with Vodafone. We work with AT&T. And in some countries, there's lack of roaming available. So we'll work with, let's say, China Mobile uh, or, or, or uh, Safaricom in Kenya, uh, if, if need be. Thank you for that. Uh, and the last question of today, do you use the commercial off the shelf antennas or are you designing your custom antennas for each product? Very good question. Very good question. Uh, actually both. So let me see if I can actually for this go back to one of the use cases. Um, let me see. So what you can see here is uh, in this slide, there's a, a, yeah, a, a barcode under that barcode. There's a uh, antenna trace so we actually uh, created this antenna trace into the pcb which uh is 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 really cost effective uh we created a solution here that's uh like around 12 dollars um which is of course uh extremely low um and uh in terms of uh, uh off-the-shelf antennas our track has uh off the shelf antenna in there. So um, one of our uh, um, uh, yeah, preferred approaches with working with, uh, with, uh, with these antennas uh, because is because it saves a lot of development effort. It, it, it allows for more flexibility, more bands, more ne network types. Um, so, so a lot of advantages there too. So if you go for cost, design your own. If you go for wider availability and quality, buy off the shelf. Then I think we are through also with the questions and we can uh, finish the session. Thank you so much, Oli, really. It was amazing to hear your insight about this variety of different use cases. And also I am personally thankful for the emphasis on creating more sustainable uh, products in the future. I hope this would be, I mean, we will have to do it in one day, I'm sure, but I hope this will be sooner than we are forced to do, let's say. But thank you so much for sharing all these insights. Thank you as well. And uh, I hope many others can join us on this, on this journey um, of, uh, of world-friendly IoT. So uh, thank you, Janset, and, uh, and to your team as well for, uh, for making this happen. Cool. And thank you for the audience and the great questions, of course. Yeah, thanks everyone. Uh, then we will continue tomorrow at 9 a.m. with the seamless IoT topic, also maybe kind of touching to the point on sustainability there. And yeah, tomorrow afternoon, we will talk about the power saving mode there, where Oli also briefly mentioned about the EDRX. We will deep dive into those power saving modes with cellular IoT. And I hope, see, I hope to see everyone there. And until then, have a great day. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.